If women do better, economies do better. Those are the words of the former head of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde. According to the IMF, Africa's large economies like Ethiopia, Morocco, and Nigeria could add a whooping 35% to their economies by bringing more women into the workplace. But what happens when they do enter the workplace? Are they safe? Do they prosper? Do they do better? Think sexual harassment, fighting for promotion, for equal pay, for maternity leave, and the list goes on. If you're a woman, you've probably been there. Today, we want to look at the challenges women face while in the workplace. Hello, welcome to Our Voices. I am Orion Itangishaka. Here with me is my co-host, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick, Ayan Bior, and also joining us on our discussion today at the table is Keinde Ajayi, lead of the World Bank's Gender Innovation Lab Youth Employment Research. Welcome, Kainde. Welcome. Welcome Thank to the you. show. Thank you. And joining us via Skype from the Ugandan capital, Kampala, is Rita Akutwasa. She's the director of IST, Institute for Social Transformation, who I met while on travel in Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. Hi, Rita. Hi, hi. Thank you for being with us. I recently had a chance to travel to Kampala, Uganda, and talk with market women entrepreneurs in Kalere who are striving to grow their businesses beyond the market. They enlisted help from an NGO called IST, Institute for Social Transformation, to address some of their frustration about their work environment with the city of Kampala. Let's take a look. We're here at Kalera Market, Kampala, Uganda, where many women in this market are asking for their conditions to change. The conditions of sexual harassment, sanitary situation, childcare situation, that they need change. They met with the authorities of the city of Kampala, as well as the UN Office of Gender Equality and Empowerment of Women in a town hall meeting and demanded for better work environment and conditions. Women are routinely sexually and physically assaulted while at work in the market. Josephine Mukisa describes the circumstances of sexual harassment against early morning small business entrepreneurs who have to be in the market as early as 4 a.m. to sell or trade with wholesale vendors from other markets. The challenge we have with coming very early is that at times we come across hoodlums who often rape women. Others simply insult and sexually harass women with so much obscene words. They touch and grope you, your customers could be right in front of you, they would still grope your breast and your butt aggressively. When you tell them to stop it, they get irritated and start shouting horrible insults at you, even in front of your own kids. It's so humiliating. Betty Mwanzi's main concern is for women small business entrepreneurs like herself who do not have access to designated women-only bathrooms. The toilet we have, it is mixed men and women. So well, as we go there, you find that women, we have nowhere to put our pads. You don't find there jail cans to wash our, eh? as you know. But uh, my request to KCC is, if it is possible, in their programs they have, they can build for us a toilet, a good toilet, uh, whereby the toilet is separated for men and women. Namatovulo Kadia sells cassava in Kalera Market. She says the most pressing issue as a vendor is child care. As the market's authority have begun enforcing an old market regulation that forbids parents from bringing their children to work in the market. We are requesting Kampala Capital City Authority to design an area in the market where we can keep our children while we're working. We cannot leave them at home alone, so the city authorities should help us in finding a place where they can care for until it's time to return home. IST, Institute for Social Transformations representative, says women have taken an important first step in coming together to demand action. 
I would start by answering that question to ask how important is the G7 coming together? How is important is COMESA coming together? How important would the European be, Union be coming together? So it's a whole question about collective organizing, collective voice, being able to identify yourselves as one and be able to fight issues that affect you on a common ground. Leocadia, however, is not very hopeful for the future. If Kampala Capital City Authority and other authorities implement what we have discussed, then we have hope for change. But if the ideas are just left on paper and not included in their programming, then our hopes will just fade. So Rita, while there, uh, it was my impression that the leadership, whether it be the city or the commission of the market, weren't sensitive to the issues of women. Why was that so? I think, of course, it comes from the issue of priorities. And when you look at, uh, especially in Uganda, the priorities, you always find that issues that affect women come last on the list, if actually not missing totally on the list. Because when you look at the management of the city, for instance, they well know, understand that everyone in the city does shopping from the various markets. Of course, you visited one of them. But there are very uh, precarious conditions in which these women work in. And worst not to say that those conditions even affect the hygiene and, and the health of the foods that we all purchase from there. But of course, uh, to the city, it's not number one on their priority. That's why you find that the women will work in some spaces where there are no toilet facilities, that they will have no daycare centers where their children can be able to rest or learn when the businesses are going gone. Uh, and more so to say that most of them are working under the scorching sun and the, the rain, that when it rains, they just want to work under such conditions that are not very favorable to their health, but mm -hmm. also for them to attract the clients that they need so badly to be able to sell. Mm -hmm. In the Ugandan case, it sounds like it isn't the priority, but, you know, as you've heard in the story, there are sexual harassment issues that not being able to have what to take their children. I mean, men have mothers, daughters, sisters. Why aren't they sensitive but, but, in your you know, view? Orion, for me, this seems like an issue that goes just beyond that marketplace. It's really these are universal issues I think that women struggle with, um, whether this is in the informal sector or in the private sector. You know, I think we need to look at how to gender proof. I really love this term, how to gender proof our work environments, because we're bringing women into a workspace that isn't really designed with them in mind. Traditionally, these were just spaces for men. So we really need to think about how do we meet women needs because if organizations are going to want to attract women and also retain them they're really going to have to show that they are committed to changing the work environment changing the work culture and I really hope we can we can start hearing more and I think this is already happening but hearing civil society in the media you know in legislation and politicians all start to hold organizations accountable um, on that score and I mean, what is your view I am yeah I mean I think you're absolutely right Haiti I think that that change will come um, not only when women enter the workforce but when we are in positions of power because mm. one I do think right. that we are stronger in numbers but I do think that having women in high positions of power whether it be you know in, in, in Kampala and in government or even in the marketplace mm. I think that these women can be in positions where they are advocating um, for a sexual harassment policy right. or they are advocating um, for pump stations for women who need to um, to pump breast milk but I think that that only happens when you have women in those places and because men are not like you when said, you have right? the numbers absolutely right. yeah, let me bring it back to Kainde in your view in some of the research you've done, you know, in seg um, segregation in the employment sector, what are some of the things you think are the issues? So uh, some of the recent work we've done, we have a recent report that's come out that's addressing this fact that even though women, especially across Africa, are a large part of the um, labor force, mm -hmm. Uh, they still have lower um, levels of earnings, both mm -hmm. in formal jobs and in the private sector and in jobs and informal no jobs. Mm -hmm. And one of the big uh, core areas um, that we outline is the fact that there are contextual factors that matter. Mm -hmm. So the legal environment, whether there are laws that um, determine how uh, property rights are allocated, whether women have access to land, whether they have access to different assets, mm -hmm. what the rules are about 
things like employee provided, employee mandated provision of childcare. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are a lot of countries in other parts across the world where um, there are laws requiring um, government. Uh, employers to provide child care. Uh, another issue in terms of contextual factors is um, things like social norms, mm -hmm. whether there are uh, norms in the society that women should do certain types of work, mm -hmm. um, that certain types of spaces are the spaces that women should be in, uh, what the rights are for women in terms of addressing uh, gender-based violence um, and having protections in that. And so there is uh, a lot of work showing that those are some things that could So it sounds like there is an issue with gender roles that are still very intrinsic in how people behave uh, even in the workplace and allowing women to just be women uh, it seems like it's still being yeah. challenged by the yeah, roles. absolutely and, and we were talking earlier I said that this is why we also need men to enter female dominated workforces like mm -hmm. nursing or uh, you know child care yes one of the big constraints women face in the workforce is having constraints on their time mm -hmm. so in a lot of contexts across Africa women are the primary caregivers uh, and so uh, one of the big constraints to them uh, engaging more in work is the fact that they have these commitments. And so different types of interventions to encourage men to take on a greater role in terms of child care and other domestic duties is one approach that could be found to uh, reduce the constraints that women face and allow them to engage more in employment and to have higher uh, I, I agree with you on that because it's like charity, right? It begins at home. You know, when, when we have men also um, playing that role, I see men also then coming forward and fighting for paternity rights, yeah. um, you know, more paternity leave. Uh, but I want to ask you something very, very quickly about the treatment of women by other women, because sometimes having other women that can help, but I've also seen and experienced incidents where women have been really sometimes the culprits of holding other women back. Uh, but how does one begin or even start to fix that issue? Because it's not a conversation we as women are very excited to have, but it's there, it exists, and I'm sure many of us have experienced it too. Correct, perhaps in the, in the market leadership, there's probably a woman who's supposed to be advocating for his her friend and aren't. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, this comes back to the fact that women are a large part of uh, the labor force, mm -hmm. um, but have different social networks, tend to have different social mm -hmm. networks than men do. And that, again, provides in some time, situations a constraint to women in terms of accessing the type of support that they need to mm -hmm. uh, really excel or succeed in the, in the workplace. Well, what challenges do you see women face in the workplace and what are some of the solutions? Join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at VOA Our Voices. And we're also on WhatsApp. The number is on your screen. We'd like to thank our guest, Rita Akutwasa, the director of IST, Institute for Social Transformation in Uganda. She joined us from Skype, from Kampala. And of course, Kahinde Ajayi, the lead of the World Bank's Gender Innovation Lab Youth Employment Research for joining us today. After the break, we'll switch gears a little bit to take a look at the wage gap for women. And if it can be closed, we'll be right back. is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues. It's about listening to them. And bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation. You're with our voices. Welcome back. The World Economic Forum estimates that the global gender gap will take 108 years to close and the gender pay gap will take even longer, 202 years. In the next part of our discussion on women in the workplace, we shift the gears a bit and ask what is driving this wage gap and how does unequal pay in the workplace affect women on the continent? And I'd like to welcome Helen Fisser hai She's the CEO of F3 Global based here in Washington. She works with women entrepreneurs across Africa and in the diaspora to help improve their capacity and give them access to trainings and networking opportunities. Helen, welcome back to Our Voices. So good to have Thank you back. You. Nice to see you again. Ladies, it's going to take 202 it's years. It's two lifetimes. <laughs> I mean, it two feels centuries. great to know that your great, great, great granddaughter might have a Benefits. chance at equal pay for equal. Well, we better work. start I mean, now. We're so it? much closer now. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know, even know what we're supposed but to do. But why is it going to take that long? I mean, I guess we can talk about it. I, but. It's amazing. Helen, why do you think we still have a pay gap at this moment? I feel like the simple answer, honestly, is that 
the world and men that control the world really don't see us as equals, right. clearly. Because if they did and they saw the multiplying effect of having a woman earn as much as you, who contributes times two as you, right. then you would recognize that it actually puts more money in your pocket, actually, by paying right. the woman next to you a little mm -hmm. bit more. And I couldn't agree with you more. Mm -hmm. It is about the, pi the power dynamics in mm -hmm. the workforce mm -hmm. and the people who hold the power traditionally have not been people who look like us. Mm -hmm. And I think that they are afraid of losing that power to women who look like us. But, and that's oh, what we're really fighting against. It's mm -hmm. these power that's dynamics exactly. that are against us. It's a, it's a lack mentality. Like, mm -hmm. you think it, by giving her more, that you're gonna lack something. But right? it's not even more, it's the same. Equal exactly. pay, equal pay. But that's more, right? <laughs> that's I, true. I, I th and the, the logic behind it all just always blows my mind that right. there is no logic behind it. Because for me, it's very simple. I always look around me wherever I've worked in my life. I've looked mm -hmm. around and I have asked myself, what are the men doing right now that I cannot do? Um, what am I doing that they cannot do? And, you know, is there anything that they do better yeah. than I do? And if the answer is no on all of that, why on earth am I not, am I being paid less? So that's always been, I mean, even when I was younger, I wasn't as outspoken about it as I became later on in my life. But we've got to push for this harder every single time, especially because it doesn't make sense. And right. I think that we also have to know our worth, which is something that I think a lot of women really struggle with. I, I totally agree. I find that when I have male clients, right. even if they're startup businesses, they're so confident in their business and they're so like, yes, I deserve to get paid two hundred and fifty dollars right, an right, hour. Right. I'm like, really you just started. When I find a woman who has ten times more of the experience of that same man mm -hmm. will say, Oh, well, is that too high? Well right. she constantly asks for uh, affirmations and confirmation mm. that you know she's right. charging too much, mm. right? right? And, and I think it starts as kids. We we, talk. Yeah. So we we really look at this logically because even what I said earlier, I'm not. I'm, I'm looking at my contemporaries. You know, right. people who are doing the same work that I'm. I'm not saying I should earn as much as the CEO, right. but but someone who is doing what what I'm doing. And I think women mm. are practical that yeah, and way. Maybe, yes, exactly. And Helen, maybe in the trainings that you've been giving these women on the continent, what mm -hmm. are some of the tricks in the books that you teach them? You know, one interesting training we did was in Ethiopia. Um, um, and it was on, it was focused around marketing yourself, but we talked about a shame culture, right? Mm. So in those cultures, and I, I'm from Eritrea, so we have the same similar culture. It's the same, it's a shame culture where you don't, a girl does not walk around saying, I'm the best, look at me, pay me for what I deserve. It's almost like you have to be recognized. Mm -hmm. And so we got to get out of that as women and say like, I worked hard, I have the same education, I earned this, so you have, right. this is the value, and this is what you need to pay me. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you, not, you, not make excuses or not ask for anything else. Hey, and you and said some, you spoke to someone in Ghana. Well, so yeah, and, and it, it really goes to what you were saying, Helen, mm -hmm. about culture. You know, I, I'm from South Africa, and I don't know how it is in the countries you guys are from, but we don't really talk about how much we earn. No. Um, it's just not, it's taboo. And of mm -hmm. course, organizations like that, that it's taboo, because, you know, nobody knows how much the other earns. And so I um, just traveled to Ghana recently, Recently, and I spoke to a very interesting woman, Lilipal um, Baba Otu, and she's the CEO and founder of an organization called Bridge for Equity Ghana. And we talked about, um, you know, uh, equality. We talked about equity when it comes to pay. Mm -hmm. She mentioned something very interesting mm -hmm. about how when a woman gets married, mm -hmm. that just changes the dynamics mm -hmm. of what sure you does. find out, what you <clears throat> ask around um, the pay gap. And just take a listen. Gender pay gap in Ghana happens because of um, how they perceive a woman to be, especially when she's married. Let's say you're in the same position with a guy, they will think he has more responsibilities when it comes to money. And so they, you know, tend to pay him a little bit more than you are, but you're doing the same job. It's hard to know how much your male counterparts are being paid, but when you compare to your friends or your spouse, you can tell that you're being cheated. And this is so fascinating um, to me, you know, because Lily Paul also um, said uh, organizations are going to have to come to terms with the fact that women are becoming the breadwinners. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you shouldn't just assume that a woman in the workplace is, is necessarily because she's married, she's being taken care of right. by right. a man. Those dynamics are changing and everybody just better get with the program. Mm -hmm. And something else that I think needs to change is I think that women need to be more comfortable negotiating their salaries. Um, and I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you about that because I've read in a lot of places that women just don't don't negotiate the, uh, uh, for their salaries. Have you heard of this? And what's your advice to women who might be trying to negotiate for you know their salaries? No, I agree. A lot of women don't negotiate. I have friends, I have clients who don't even negotiate the terms of the contract mm -hmm. because they're a little bit scared, right? Um, they feel like 
maybe they're grateful for whatever the situation may be. But again, it goes back to knowing your value and knowing the value of the work that you're producing. And then stick to that. But are the, the, the leadership, the, 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 the bosses also at least sensitive to women no. in the workplace? I would love to say that they are, but I don't think so. And remind them, <laughs> remind them. If remind you're able them. to pull up your work and show what you have done, I think it's a right. great refresher. They come back to you, though. Right? And right. teach them. I try to teach people lessons, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't hire me the first time and you go and hire someone who is my male counterpart who's going to charge you 10 times more but deliver less, you're going to come back to me because you know my value. And then you charge that me more. Then I charge you point. more. That is so interesting. We'll have to stop it right there, ladies. I'd like to thank Helen Fisahai for joining us once again. It's been a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Helen. Great to have you with us. Helen Fisahai is the principal chief strategist of F3 Global LLC. Well, after the break, we'll introduce you to our women to watch. She'll share her personal story of harassment in the workplace. That experience ultimately forced her to quit her job and motivated her to start a nonprofit that now advocates for women in her native country, Mali. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Our Voices. It's time for a Women to Watch segment. Everyday African women on the continent and in the diaspora are doing extraordinary things. And today we highlight the contribution of our VOA colleague from the Bambara French to Africa service, Kadiatu Traore. She's the founder of the Association for Solidarity, Aid and Action in Mali. Welcome Kadiatu. Wow. Good to have you. Welcome. We're so happy to have <laughs> you. Thank you for having me, oh. and I'm so honored to be part of your beautiful team. Uh, Thank you so much. Like I, I, I talk every time my voice is yes. our voice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now you're part of our voice. Finally, you're part of our voice. Yeah, finally, I'm here and uh, with you. Thank you oh. so much. Thank you for having you. me. And set? Yes, okay, for thanks. sure. Well, we're going to get right into it, Kadia, too. What drove you to start the nonprofit that you started in Mali? Well, um, in Mali, I work uh, as a prominent, prominent uh, government staff ma uh, members. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I faced the worst time uh, in my career mm -hmm. uh, when the new boss, uh, you know, solicited me sexual favors. Mm. It was a very, very uh, complicated situation for me. And uh, he made my job uh, a living hell uh, when I did not give in mm. to his uh, advances. So um, I thought this uh, situation will be, uh, you know, very, very uh, a safe worse. place. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because in our society, uh, it's a very, very a complicate to to say that a man could you know put up the woman mm -hmm. and uh, in this kind of situation so mm -hmm. but you know when i i refuse his advances i refuse his, uh, his advances uh, they put at me to the resignation mm -hmm. so you know uh, i uh, lose my well paying positions wow. and so I decided to go forward to the job but 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 they and decided to, to launch <laughs> an organization like a non-profit organization mm -hmm. to help a wo other women who were going to these issues mm -hmm. and also and also I would like to my voice is, mm -hmm. yeah. my voice to be her. Kadiatu, I really have a lot of respect for your generation because you guys really laid the groundwork for young women, women like me. We come into the workforce now and we know what our rights are. Right. It's right. in large part because of the, the work that you have done um, to fight for your, um, for your own rights in the workplace. And I wonder, looking back at, you know, at, at really your career, um, when you look at the workforce now, um, do you think that we are where we're supposed to be, or is there more work to do? Oh, yes, 
Of course. Of course, because, uh, you know, um, I was, uh, you know, talked to myself mm -hmm. and uh, said, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it should be uh, started by something, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. The women, the women do not react uh, to that kind of situation mm -hmm. when it's happening. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I said to myself that I took that decision to myself and I uh, said, and maybe, I would, I, I'm going to get some voices mm. added to mine and, you know, fighting mm. uh, speaking against of that, that uh, issues. Did you, speaking of that, did you get any support from either family, community, or anywhere else? It, a few, a very few support. Did people fight you back? A very few support. Friend of mine he told me, you have not to do that. Mm. I say, why? When I said, why? I asked why, she said, you know what I'm talking about it. You know where you're from. Mm -hmm. you, have not, you have not to do that kind of, you know, create okay. that kind of uh, a situation because it it's, it's could be another, you know, create another problem mm -hmm. to you, okay. uh, to yourself and to your family also. Mm -hmm. But I see, well, that, you. that was a big frustration for me mm -hmm. and uh, I decided, you know, to express my frustration mm -hmm. and to, to just uh, tell to people, mm -hmm. we you. have a right. We are women and we have a right in the society. Thank you so, so much, Kadiatu, for sharing your story with us. Thank we really you. Well, Kadiatu, because you used your voice, I'm sure you have emboldened a generation of women to use their voice as well. And we also want you to use your voice. Who do you think deserves a shout out? Use the hashtag BOARVoices and tell us who you think is a woman to watch in the fight for a better workplace for women and closing the wage gap. Also, be sure to watch Our Voices on the VOA website where you can find the world's top news stories. And we leave you with a quote from American journalist and the niece of the late U.S. President John F. Kennedy, who signed the Equal Pay Act into law in 1963. Maria Shriver used her voice to say, when we pay women less than men, we're telling women their work isn't as valuable. We're all equally valuable and we should be paid equally. And that's our final word for this week. I'd like to say thank you to our guests, Kahinde Kenny Ajayi of the World Bank's Gender Innovation Lab Youth Employment Research, Rita Akutuasa, Director of ISD, Institute for Social Transformation, and last but not least, Helen Fisahai, CEO of F3 Global LLC, and also Kadiatu Traore. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, and I really appreciate it. Yes. On behalf of the Voice of America, along with my colleagues, thanks for tuning in to this week's Our Voices. I'm Orian Itangishak. Good day.